Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Welcome to another edition of Musical Talk. I'm Thos Ribbits, because someone's got to be. Well, it's one of those odd ironies that the era of silent film has been tremendously well served by musical theatre and musical film. And I think that's because it's one of those periods that seems to be teeming with interest and still has relevance today. After all, the industry was brand new in those days, and it was learning what it could and couldn't do. But I suspect none of those pioneers at the beginning of the 20th century would have any idea that their work would be the foundation stones for the modern world of film, both in Hollywood and everywhere else across the world. It truly is a global industry, and occasionally, when it can be bothered, a global art. And I don't mean that sneeringly, because we all know that show business is a business, and that's very true in the world of film. But in all creative endeavours, there's always been that argument between art and business. We've seen it in Merrily We Roll Along, of course, but it's a much older story than that. But there is, to my incredible delight, going to be a wonderful revival of a musical, a British musical, that investigates this very thing in Hollywood, which, at the time of broadcast, has just opened at the Fimbra Theatre. And that show is The Biograph Girl. You may never have heard of it, and if you haven't, it's a great pity, because it was an amazing creative success in 1980 when it first premiered at the Phoenix Theatre in London's West End. With book by Warner Brown and score by David Henniker, who you're probably most likely to know as the composer of Half a Sixpence, the show received rave reviews, although for some reason it only lasted for a couple of months. And it hasn't been professionally revived since. Well, that has changed. As I say, from today, the date of broadcast of this episode, the 22nd of May 2018, there is a chance to see it in a professional production at London's Finborough Theatre in West Brompton. It's running from today, the 22nd of May, until the 9th of June, so you've got three weeks to try and see it. And the piece itself covers the period of 1912 until about 1928, when the talkies arrived. And if you want to find out what happened after that, go and see Singing in the Rain. But The Biograph Girl covers the stories of Lillian Gish and Mary Pickford, two of the earliest Hollywood stars, who in their way were made famous by D.W. Griffiths, one of the great pioneer directors of the Hollywood film, but who was in his own way an idealist, and for whom filmmaking was about art and fun which, whilst being a wonderful set of ideals, regrettably doesn't butter the parsnips, as they say. And so one of the themes of the piece is how those ideals were superseded by Hollywood becoming the home of film as an industry. For me, the excitement is a well-written musical about an interesting subject with a fantastic score by one of Britain's greatest, and, I'm sorry to say, least well-remembered, composers, David Henniker. I sat down with the director of the Finsborough Theatre's production of The Biograph Girl, Jenny Eastop, to talk about this wonderful piece and to investigate a bit more the themes, the resonances and the amazing work of Warner Brown and David Henniker. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. My name's Jenny Eastop. I'm the director, artistic director of Mercurius Theatre, and I'm the director of The Biograph Girl at the Finborough Theatre by Warner Brown and David Henniker. Now, I want to talk about The Biograph Girl because, well, it's got a number of things that attracted me to it. First of all, it's a little-known British musical, and it is part of a festival of British music theatre, which the Finborough Theatre likes to put on periodically and has been doing now for many years. And it keeps coming up with gems, so that itself is an excellent pedigree. And, of course, it's got the name David Henniker attached to it. 
he's one of those names that isn't as well known as he ought to be. When you look at his career, it's astounding. He's the first person to have two shows running concurrently on Broadway, uh, who's British, well before Andrew Lloyd Webber. And of course, in London, until just last year, we had Half a Sixpence, revised by Stars and Drew, but still a David Henniker show. And of course, that show was revised by Warner Brown, who's the writer of this show with David yes. Henniker from 1980, who I think has revised it for this production. He has, yes, he's very involved. So that attracted me. But what attracted you as the director to the Biograph Girl? Well, I have to say straight away that I, I came across it because it's, it's a Finborough find. It's the <laughs> Finborough Theatre found it. As you say, it's one what of the discovered gems, <laughs> yes. They have a list of, of different plays and musicals, and this is you know, part of their list. When I first read it, I really liked the subject matter. I thought it was fascinating, that idea of the, of the early days of the silent movie era. It's a particular part of, of the, the, the film history that, I, that I've always really liked. I loved silent films from, from when I was quite young. But what I really liked about this was the storyline, first of all, the whole idea of going back. We, we take for granted so much the sort of glossy, multi, multi-billion dollar industry that it's become. And we forget that it started off as people on rooftops so they didn't have any lighting, they used the sunlight, flickers, it was in flea pits, no reputable person would even go to the early cinemas to see it, let alone be involved in it. It's where theatre was, almost 70 years before that. It yes, early absolutely. Victorian yes absolutely. Nice so, people didn't go. Yes, yes, so it had got a, a terrible reputation. Those early innovators were incredibly imaginative and inc- incredibly exciting with, with the ideas that they came up with, that they, that they, that they changed the face. It created, as Warner Brown is always saying, created an entirely new art form that we just now take for granted so I really like the subject matter the more I read it the more the characters really came off the page it's one of those pieces that you first read it and think oh that's that's very interesting but as you go through it you realize how incredibly well written all the scenes are the short scenes between the music numbers musical numbers you realize quite how finely detailed they are and how much there is in there and the characters started to come to life the lyrics are so clever they undercut the music constantly the music creates one mood while the lyrics are quite cynically undercutting it with actually what's happening songs like the industry which is about how those early innovative days of excitement when they were kids at play have turned into now this multi-million dollar at the time industry but I mean overriding everything is this amazing music which is just it's very early on I it got stuck in my head as we were working on it and, and I'm very pleased to see say it's it's still in there I, I, it's I don't want to get rid of it. it's head, very not... good music to have stuck in your head yeah it's it's wonderful so as a package it's it's an incredible piece that sort of does everything that you need to do with a piece of art you go to the theater and it will move you we were even we were running in our little rehearsal room we were running one of the numbers the industry which is being choreographed got a wonderful choreograph, uh, choreographer holly hughes who choreographed it as really sort of telling a story of how it's now become an industry and it moved me to tears i was there i had to hide the fact that i was almost blubbing because it is <laughs> such a beautiful piece of of storytelling through the music and the lyrics now, you've said so much in that opening conversation, if I may say that there's Sorry. so much... No, it's, don't never apologise, it was great. I want to unpick a couple of things, if I may. I like the parallel here. You've said that, you know, there's a great story and um, the lyrics undercut the music. But I suppose what I really love here is actually the parallel with silent films, because silent films were anything but silent. What they were, of course, was films without a soundtrack at least recorded, but there was always someone in the cinema playing the piano or later on the organ, Mm -hmm. whatever it is, to create atmosphere and mood and emotion. And of course, it depends on the individual player because they weren't necessarily written scores for these things. So they were improvised to a degree. And of course, depending on the personality of that musician would be how those bits of music supported or undercut the drama that was going on on the screen, on the flickering screen. So I really like the idea that actually that you've got that sophistication here, but also the parallel. I I like the idea of lyrics undercutting an emotional mood and vice versa in a song. I think that's a sign of sophistication, sometimes a master of that. But actually, I think of it tremendously as a British trait, where actually British conversation is about not saying what you actually feel or think. It's about using language actually to express yourself whilst never actually saying it overtly. Everything is retractable. And it feels to me like actually this is a tonally British musical just from that very description you've given. Yes, that's that's a very good point. I think it is. I mean, one of the things that I say about the scenes, about once you start unpicking them, you start to realise that on first reading they seem to be saying one thing, but actually exactly as you say, there's a lot going on under the surface 
the, the meaning between the lines of what's not said and you start to realise how they should be played. And similarly, there's, there's, interestingly, there's several points where scenes between two people have music played underneath them. Okay. And it's very, it's very interesting that we've been playing with that, looking at this one in particular, scene between Mary and Zucker, where the music is, a, is an interpretation, a sign of how she's playing or trying to play Zucker. So it's a, it's a, it's a comic... Uh, undertone of what she's pretending to be as opposed to what we're sort of reading what's actually happening in the scene and then there's a there's a second piece of music the second scene where the music is played uh, we've we've really looked at and, and explored whether we should we should play the scene in the mood that the music is setting up or whether that is a, a cynical undercutting of what's actually playing that's an interpretation of what's going on underneath the surface uh, so so it's very interesting seeing that it, it's I think it's um, it's unusual for me to come across that, that sort of underscoring of, of scenes with music that can be interpreted in lots of different ways. And once again, that's a modern parallel. We were talking just a minute ago about how there would always be a musical underscore, if you like, but even in the modern art of film, incidental music is a very important part. But I'm going to ask you another question, and I think you've sort of answered it, but I'd just like to clarify. So the text as written, if you like, the, the paperwork of the score and the words, don't actually say undercut or play. It's, it's intrinsic in the way it's written. But what, what flexibility is you as a, uh, do you as a director have to enhance, you know, how are you stamping you on this? Oh, that's a, yes, that's a difficult question. As, as we said at the beginning, I'm, Warner Brown has been very much involved right from the beginning. I'm, I'm delighted to say he, he just is, is incredibly generous in his, in his time yeah. and in his input. And he has um, a huge pedigree. I mean, very yeah. much so, yes. And he's incredibly busy with the things that he's doing at the moment, flying all over the place mm. in New York and back here and off. So it's, it's amazing that he's really worked with us on this. And he's, he's gone back to the script and had a look and made some little changes and had the chance to sort of tinker with things and some of the lyrics of the songs. So I do feel uh, it's interesting as a director because I do feel a great responsibility mm. to interpret his work and David Henniker's work in the right vein, in the way that it was written, and not misinterpret or misunderstand what's actually going on. So a huge amount as a director is about what does the writer actually mean at this point? And I've tried not to bother him by you know phone calls and you know emails too much. It's mainly been about changes to the script. So that on the one hand, there's the responsibility as a director not to misinterpret and not to make mistakes. But on the other hand, there is a huge freedom in being able to say, well, yes, actually, I think we should push that. I think we can go further with that. I think we can, I think we can do this. And maybe in our production, we can change it into something slightly different in a way that it wouldn't be played if it was a West End production. It makes a big difference having it on a small, intimate stage where the audience are very close than having it on a large stage. Uh, Warner was, was great. On the first day, he came in and met everybody and chatted. We had a, we oh, had nice. a meet and greet and a sing-through yeah. of some of the numbers. And it was lovely. And he was there to answer questions and tell us lots of anecdotes and stories. And, and he's, he's a wonderful personality, and, and everybody adored him straight away. And he said at the time... If there are any stage directions, any particular bits of staging that don't work for you, just change them. It's fine. Oh, right. That's, don't be, it's nice to have license, isn't it? It's, almost, it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, and I think I, I took that as a, as a really very flattering sign that he sort of, tr- hopefully he's right to do that, that he trusted my interpretation that I wasn't going to play fast and loose with his, with his script. But it is, it is very interesting how much license we do have to take within the meaning and the feel of the, of the piece to change it from something that was written for a large West End stage to in something intimate, in 1980, mm. to something intimate like, like the Finbra. So that leads me on, and once again I'd like to explore more of your role as director, because it seems to me what you're saying there is, in fact there are, within the role of director, almost two directions you have to sort of uh, reconcile. There is, if you like, the ambassadorial interpretive aspect, that you know the piece is the piece and you are here to interpret it and bring it onto the stage and make it live. That is a creative problem in itself, but you also have the creative concept of having a vision for the piece in your own right. And it's, it seems to me a very interesting balancing act, and therefore a fusion, I hope, of knowing which path to take to be, as you exactly say, be true to the piece, whilst making it your interpretation 
this yeah. production, not the last production or another production. Yes, absolutely. I, th- I think it's it's one of the, the great struggles as a director. I, I think it's 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 relatively easy. It seems to be relatively easy for directors to think I'm going to make my I'm going to make my mm-hmm. mark as a director. I'm going to take Hamlet and put it on ice in the dark. I won't have any lighting, and it'll all be done by sound. And that certainly gets people noticing your interpretation. But the bottom line is you have to serve the piece. You have to, of course. and you have to have a reason why you want to do this. If it is, if you are doing Hamlet for the billionth time, you have to feel that you can bring something different to it that is going to unlock things that maybe other people haven't. So it's important that you that you feel that you are doing it for the right reasons. But it always comes back to, to serve the piece, to tell the story within the piece. I'm very pleased to hear that because I'm just thinking of a trend, regrettably, we see in particularly the West End, which is actually that shows are revived in the production or variants upon them that were here in the West End 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Poor old Oliver hasn't really had a chance to develop since the 1990s and now looks to me like it probably won't until someone says let's do this differently and I don't know who that someone's going to be. So I really like the fact that ironically the Biograph Girl which was tremendously well received critically in 1980, but only ran for a month or two, I think, actually is in some ways could be described as being a more living piece, because here is a brand new interpretation showing that it's still got legs. Yes, yeah, it's interesting. It's all, it is almost like a, like a new musical, particularly with Warner looking at it again and, and putting in, he's put in a couple of numbers that weren't, that one in particular that wasn't ever used. It was written in 1980 by him and David Hennick, but wasn't used at the time. Is it possible to ask you a few more details about that? You know, what, what are these songs? Yes. And you, can you see why they weren't used originally? Well, there was there was one in particular. What what happened, which is quite interesting, is that there was the original production, and there's an original cast recording, mm. which actually J Records have offered, and we've got on sale after the oh, uh, after our production. So people will hear a recording from the West original West End cast, yes. having seen our Finborough production. So it's going to be interesting. But the original cast recording was made, and then after that. Uh, David Henniker and Warner Brown sat down and made up the script for it to be published by Samuel French. And at the time, there was a number that hadn't been on the original cast recording, but they'd written called they called them flickers, which they put in. So that's in the original script, but there's no recording of it. And they also cut a number that had been used in the original cast recording called Digging Gold Dust when they mm. moved from New York to California. So it was it was played and sung in the West End production. It's not in the script and the reason they cut it is because it's very it's completely incongruous it's not 1920s 1912 to 1928 is when is the 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 time that the that the show goes over it's very late 70s 80 it's oh, it's so, it era. comes out of nowhere it's obvious era and so they thought that's not really a and they cut it and warner said to me i Put that back. And I said, yeah, I would love that because it's so jazz hands, yeah. digging, going, yeah! And it just, the, the stage, hopefully the stage sort of explodes with this life of them moving to California. So that's gone back in. But the big change that's happened is a song that Warner and David wrote at the time called Rivers of Blood. And it, it was, it was a, a strange thing. When I first read the show, the only thing that made me slightly concerned was that in the show, D.W. Griffith makes Birth of a Nation, and it's huge success, and everything is positive about it, then it moves on to, then he makes Intolerance, and that doesn't go so well, because audiences don't come, because the First World War breaks out. And I said to Warner, I just feel that 1980 was a different time, Mm, and is it possible to just acknowledge the fact that even at the time, it was very controversial because obviously it's a deeply racist film, not even of its time. It's Indeed. A, and not that we should forgive things uh, no, no, because no, they're but, of their time. But it but is of its own context. Yes, yes yeah. And he said, uh, he said that's, that's amazing because we wrote a song called Rivers of Blood. And I believe he wrote a song called Rivers of Blood, which at the time wasn't used because it was seen as too controversial necessarily. We shouldn't bring in that subject matter because we don't want to discuss it. Because it's very resonant in a British context. That, that, that's yes, that, that, that's the honest. name of that. Yes. It's a quoting a speech by Enoch Powell from the late 60s, I think, yes, yes. Uh, which is all about racism. Yes, yeah. Um, so, it, so it really resonates with yes. that. And I think even nowadays... You know, way back to that time, people not necessarily hearing that speech, and of course, there's been the anniversary mm. recently of it. But uh, but people know that 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 quote and that, yeah. that the sort of context of it. But so Warner has written a, a short scene in where Mama Gish is trying to say to Lillian, "Look, there's there's riots, there's controversy, there's," and Lillian, of course, won't hear anything yes. about it. And then we have one actor coming on, doubling, coming on as the Man of the South singing this song, and it is, I think, it's incredibly chilling because he's basically saying. Movie man, movie man, look what you've done. Yes, yeah, quite. And it's and it's not only a song about acknowledging the controversy and that Griffiths just blundered into something in a ridiculous way, whether he was 
deeply racist himself or whether it was just he was stupidly was from the south and just hadn't thought through the consequences of it but it's it's also it's not only a song about the racism of the film and the controversy surrounding it it's also i feel a very strong song about the responsibility of the artist to look at the consequences of what they're doing as we see in Hollywood today on different matters. I mean, the Me Too uh, movement yes, yes. Is, uh, is a different movement, but it's once again, it's being politically aware of the responsibility that comes with fame, success, film, and, and the privilege of disseminating a view into the, not the households of everyone, although ultimately, of course, that's where film ends up, yes. but actually just to the public in whichever medium it's going to yes, be delivered. Yeah, yeah. I, think it's, I think it's a very strong message that we have that responsibility, not to make things anodyne and bland oh, no. and you can't say anything, but just to think about the stories that you tell what effect they're going to have. You, you need to think of that as an artist. So, But isn't it also wonderful, therefore, that in this production, there will be that... When I say edge, I don't mean edge for its own sake, but the piece isn't just a speech-marked biopic of various famous directors and actors of the period. Um, I'm sure it was never that, but the fact that it's a little bit chewy is my favourite phrase for yes. something like this. It's just a little bit of oomph there. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, it's, it's very much... I mean, it wasn't... It, you know, it was, it, was written in, it was written in 1980... Set 1912 to, to 1928, but still incredibly resonant nowadays, and now bring in Rivers of Blood. But that, the, so many of the songs about about what happened during that period and about the industry and about how the, as I was saying earlier, about how the movie business has become a business rather than an art form, is is incredibly relevant nowadays as well as when it was first written. I think well more so that. now than perhaps in 1980, because I mean I, I know there is still art and art films being made. But um, it seems to me the balance has been changed con- very considerably. And I must tell you, if you're not a great fan of superheroes, then Hollywood yes. has very little to offer you. Yes, and that's a ridiculously short-sighted thing to say. It's a million films, and they're all wonderful, or a lot of wonderful. But but it seems to but the, the, but the canon seems changed. to be far more about the blockbuster, mm. particularly making what what the filmmakers and the business people think audiences are going to want, yes. rather than challenging audiences into different stories. It's all focus group, isn't it? Rather yes, very than, much so, yeah. yeah. Rather than because, vision. Yeah, because everything has to be, has to be a financial success. Uh, yeah. Now let's talk about some of the other resonances. You mentioned the song, I think it's called Digging for Gold? Uh, Digging Gold Dust, yeah. Digging Gold Dust. Now, of course, that has lots of different resonances. I think my favourite Hollywood-based one will be, of course, the series of films in the 1930s, The Gold Diggers of 1930, blah. Yes. Repeat ad nauseam but and of course the term gold digger is still used in certain sort of tabloidy circumstances to represent someone who might uh, pair themselves up with a, 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 a figure of authority who may be able to do them some good yes. shall we say in exchange for other services um, let's not press it but um, but of course also you know you also think of the, you know the, the gold rush and the expansion of America 50 60 years before the piece was set yes. looking for fortunes and if that's not symbolic and Absolutely, representative yes, then what yeah. isn't you know that's just one song title yes and, and I think that I think that sort of sums up what this show does and and the levels that it has it appears to be a uh, an interesting look at those 16 years of the early days of the flickers and how they turned into and it stops just as the yeah. talkies are sort of busy destroying Which is phase the careers. Two, isn't yes, it? yeah. yeah. It's quite... And it's left with a very poignant song at the end before a big one for full company, but a very poignant song about put it in the tissue paper of wrapping our dreams up and putting them away for for a later time when people will rediscover the the silent films. But so on on the surface it appears as like that. But that one song sums up. It starts with them, because of all sorts of things happening, they have to leave New York. They decide to go to... They just purely... They get a map and stick a thumb on it, and it (laughs) happens to be California is the first map they come across. They stick their thumb thumb on it, let's go to Hollywood, let's go to California. There's a line about, oh, that's where those prospectors went, isn't it? So so (laughs) So it starts off with that idea of, oh, we'll be like the prospectors going to California for the gold rush. But there's exactly as you have picked up on, there's so much in that of what they're going to go from the pure art of the rooftops with no light or anything uh, in New York where they're just making it because they feel for it and they love it and they're doing it purely for art and going to somewhere where it becomes you know very glitzy coming out of the song it goes straight into a scene with Mary Pickford meeting Adolf Zucker the head of Paramount and talking about how she wants to leave Griffith for a lot of money (laughs) so it's suddenly as soon as you get to California it becomes about business so yes, you're absolutely right. There's so many different things in that one song title and then in that one song about what the move to California means. Which takes us back to the quality of writing. It's always struck me that 
musicals are wonderful because you have extra elements and you can express so much more in, so much more in song, etc. But the narrative must be good. The narrative must be right. Mm-hmm. It, sound, it seems to me that the book here is is good. Now Warner Brown has form in this area, doesn't he? Because it does, yes. um, uh, just off the top of my head, I know he did Garbo the musical, and if she doesn't represent, I know she did some talky films, but you know she's really of that era. And I think he also did another musical called Flickers, which of yes, course is a word that comes up plenty of times yes, in yes. this. You know, an early word for the cinema or yes, the flicks, yes. as some of us still call it. You know? Yes, yes. No, it's. I mean, it's it's very much a period. He clearly knows a huge amount about, and it and has a you know real heartfelt love for that that whole period. Yes. And I think there's another resonance as well, isn't there? I mean, it's interesting that actually it's for a period which is identified as being silent, and we've already said what a nonsense that is, but for a period that's identified as being silent, it draws a lot of attention in terms of drama and musicals, to make a very false distinction, but, you know, plays in their broadest sense, because one immediately thinks, well, Max Sennett is a character in The Biograph Girl, and of course he's the central character, or at least one of them, in Mac and Mabel by Jerry Herman, which is about the similar period, and it's set over a similar period of time and the development, in his case, of his studio, through, seen through the prism of his relationship with Mabel Norman. Yes. Is there, you know, as a director coming to this, how much do you want to make sure that you keep everything in a separate box? Or how much do you contextualise it within the world as interpreted by other pieces? Yes, it's, it's yeah, it's, it, it's a difficult one because something as simple as the storytelling, it's real people and it's real events mm. and it's specific things that happened. But because it's a piece of theatre and because it's a piece of storytelling, as is always the way, whether it's in a, in a huge biography or whether it's in a, in a, a, a two-hour show like this, including an interval, uh, <laughs> um, then you have to not necessarily simplify the story, but you have to, to yeah. make, take certain things and turn them into, into slightly different forms of the storytelling. So on the one hand, it's very important, I think, that, the, that we are aware of these people and that they are the people that we know and the people that the audience will come knowing from other contexts, either yes. from the films themselves or from, as you say, other, other stories and other films and, and musicals about these characters. So it's important that the audience recognise them as the people they already know, even though this is not just a rehashing of the same story. Yes. It's, a, it's another way of telling similar stories, and it's been, it's been drawn together in a particular way. This, certainly, the, the three main characters are, are Mary Pickford and Lillian Gish, but it's specifically D.W. Griffith and his, his journey through from being the innovator and the pioneer through to him being left behind by the talkies and by the very fact that it's become an industry. Yes, his, his vision is no longer the vision. As it yes, yeah. yes, yeah. I think that's absolutely fascinating because, you know, Max Sennett has a touch of that though, doesn't he? I mean, it's, it's, it's not purely Griffith's experience. It's a wide experience and, and, as you say, it hits the big bang of talkies, which, and as we know from yet another musical, Singing in the Rain, is the end of um, so many careers. Yes. I, I, I do love all this sort of intermeshing, though, and, you know, the fact it does create... If, if you want to, you can slot this into the bigger story of musical theatre telling this era's history, yes. or you can just see that if you know nothing of those, you can see this show and still get yes, everything yeah. about this show. Yes. I, I really hope... We've, we've got a lot of... We've obviously got, we've got a Twitter account and Instagram, etc., and we've had a lot of people uh, following and retweeting and liking things from all sorts of areas of silent movie buffs mm. and musical theatre uh, fans, etc. So we've got a lot of people who I hope that we will have a lot of people in the audience who know all about the silent films and know all about these characters and are coming to see a different, mm. a different telling of their, of their story uh, and see them in a slightly different context. Um, and also musical theatre fans who will be coming along and, and seeing all of this. But I hope also, and I, and, I, and I believe this will be the case, there'll be lots of people in the audience who possibly don't know any of this, don't sure, know anything sure. about the silent films, and this is a wonderful introduction to that. And I hope then they will go away and see Singing in the Rain and see Mac and Mabel and also uh, go away and, and start to watch the, the silent films and think, what is, what is all this about, this, this particular era? Um, because it's it's an amazing. There's there's a lot of us in the in the cast. I thought I'd seen an awful lot of of silent films, and and I grew up watching them. I'm not that old, but I no, grew no, up watching them. They were being shown on television. They were, on te- they were on television when I was a boy. Yes. absolutely. Harold they, Lloyd. Uh, yes, I loved yes. Harold Lloyd. The hanging off the clock. Everybody absolutely. knows that. But yeah, I, and I yes, and 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 uh, and the early you know Buster Keaton and the Quite. early Charlie Chaplin. Just just wonderful films. Uh, but but I realised doing the research for this and starting to see some of 
uh, D.W. Griffith's films that I, uh, Judith of Bethulia in yes. 1914, which is pretty much the first full-length film. At the time, the studio bosses were even saying people's eyes couldn't cope with the, <laughs> that length of... Their eyes would hurt. They can't see more than 15 minutes at a time of these films. Uh, but, but seeing all of the, this incredible richness that, um, that sort of you know, opened my eyes to it. So I hope that there will be plenty of people who come along, that this will introduce them to, to that, that sort of era and those films. Can we talk a little bit about David Henniker? I do feel that he's the presence in the room we've not really touched on most. The reviews in 1980s, as I say, seem almost to have been universally uh, positive, and many, many of them have picked up the uh, brilliance of the score and um, his lyrics, and particularly his music. Uh, it, it was described, I think, by Jack Tinker, uh, Jack Tinker, the late Jack Tinker, I should say, uh, as a minor miracle as the piece, and he put a lot of that down to the score. David Henniker, as I say, has had this huge resurgence just recently, and of course, even as we speak, uh, one of his earliest songs, a Tim Pan Alley kind of song, um, The Thingamabob. Do yes, you know that? Yes, it's yes. being used as a television advertisement. Yes. People may say, hang on a minute, I, I don't know that song, but gr- look up Gracie Fields on YouTube, you'll find it. Yes, yeah. Um, but I think that's marvellous. If you want to know if anyone still has currency and, and resonance in the modern world, if they're in an advertisement, I work on the basis that someone thinks there's money yes, in it. Yes, so, yes, yes. And, um, well, it feels that it, it connects it, with an audience. It does, yeah. absolutely, yes. And, and it has that emotional uh, connection. So even a throwaway song like The Thing of Me Bob, and that's a song with a, uh, an earworm uh, memeing option. Because yes. I, um, I, I know it from the Arthur Askey version, I must tell you, if, I'm, if we're throwing these things around. <laughs> um, but it is one of those songs that lodges in. He's got, he, David Henniker has got a very good ear for melody and um, I did read it one, at once but he, you know he should be considered one of Britain's greatest melodists certainly of the 20th century you expressed positivity about him already in the music yes, yeah. but I, let's hear a little more I, about I, the score well, music yeah I think it, I think his I, I, yeah I think I mean, he, he's, he's an amazing writer who I thought I had a measure of I yeah. thought I knew quite well and, and liked his work very much but it's really made me realise how how incredibly clever he is, and and the uh, our musical director Harry Hayden Brown. Oh, we know he, Harry from old. He's marvellous. Oh, well, he is know, certainly know, marvellous. I, know, I, know I didn't realise that you knew. Um, no, he's, he's wonderful. When he first got the score, and we talked a lot about it, he first got the score and started going through it, and he said, "Oh, there's, there's so many really interesting musical jokes in this, and little asides to things, and it's very clever score, uh, which on my ear isn't as musically mm. attuned as Harry's. Obviously, I'm not a musical." director uh, but it's yeah it's it's not just that they're, they're amazing melodies they're amazing songs but there's so many references to things and jokes and little again it's like it's like uh, it's like the book uh, that the more you go into it the more you oh this is this is so much but I thought this was great the first time I heard it but this is so much more detailed and so Keeping much more with yes absolutely <laughs> and I, I must say the lyrics are by Warner Brown and David Henniker not just by That's David fair, Henniker yes. I think you're right to comment and, on that. and I must say um and obviously Warner Brown could, could talk about this much more, but one of the things that says a lot about David Henniker is that Warner Brown tells a story of... He was 22 when he wrote this, and David Henniker was nearly 80. This one of his, this is his penultimate show, I think. Uh, I think it is, Henniker, yes, yes, I think it is. Uh, and that Warner Brown went along to his, this new agent that he got, yeah. saying, I've written this book and I want this show, and his agent said, oh, I've got, I've got a meeting with you, with, with a composer who wants to work with you on it, has read it, wants to work on it. And, and David Henniker, who was this amazing <laughs> yeah. writer at the time. A name. Yeah, a complete name, and at, you know, at, the, the, at yeah. his pinnacle, had read this book by a 22-year-old, relatively new writer, and had said, I want to work with him. And they worked together. And Warner is full of stories of how generous David was to him and how much he, without appearing to teach him, he learnt so much from him. So I think that says an awful lot about David Henniker as a man, as well as a, a composer, that he was, even at the, at the end of his career, his penultimate yeah. show, he was looking at at new ways of exploring his work and new innovative uh, new writers coming up. I, I think that's, that says a lot about him. And I'd like to explore that a little more, but um, I'd also like to cast us back to something you said a little bit earlier about the song that was a bit resonant of the period in which it was written, that late 70s, early 80s song. But also, therefore, by contrast, I suspect you're saying that whilst not 20s, 30s music or even earlier, certainly not Edwardian music, um, the music and the score for the rest of it is essentially... Um, resonant enough to make you think that it fits with the story being told? It doesn't jar, I suppose. No, it doesn't jar at all. I mean, there's, there's a lot of music. Yeah. Like I, I know I keep going back to this one number. There's a lot yeah. of numbers yes. to it. Uh, but there's the one number, the industry, is, yeah. is a tango. Um, oh, is it? Yes. Yeah. And it's, there's a lot of music that's sort of of, its, of the time that it's set. Uh, and, but what, the, what, I'm, what I was saying about the lyrics 
sort of undercutting the music is that often the music will be setting apparently on the surface setting one mood yes and then you start which is why I say sorry I'm interrupting myself to say it's why I think I really like the fact that this is being done at the Finborough where it's so close that it's not being it's a proper intimate venue yes Yes, absolutely and the audience are going to be there sort of part of it really listening Uh, rather than it being presented to us on a West End stage we are up close and really listening to the lyrics and so you get the music setting a mood and saying one thing which takes us right oh it's a tango well that's really exciting uh there's a wonderful tap number and then you start to realize what the lyrics are saying yes. and you realize that this is a musical joke that actually that we shouldn't be thinking oh this is a wonderful tango yes it's about oh it's actually saying something completely different because of that 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 style of the music there's a sophistication there which I like, and I've mentioned that already, but I, um, funnily enough, there's a very, a very early British musical film from, I think, something like 1930, so just after this era is over, and it features a very young Cicely Courtnage. Oh, right. um, and I was sitting with, uh, watching with a friend of mine, and he made a very interesting observation, because I've always loved Cicely Courtnage, I find her very funny, and she knows how to perform, but she's, she's very young in there, she's sort of got the ingenue role, except she's undercutting it all the way through. The songs they give her in this, this right. film are... Um, you know, they're sweet and light and lovely, and yet she's absolutely undercutting it, and that's where her comic uh, comic chops come from, if you like. Right. And I love the fact that that's still happening later yes, on. Yeah, very. That, yeah, that's very much the the style of this piece. Yes. Yeah. But Hanukkah's got this enormous range because it's easy. You know, forgive me. We tend to put people in boxes or label them up, particularly after their career is over. You know, the idea that George Gershwin could only write a song that sounds absolutely like George Gershwin, for example, yes, yeah. is what we all think. But of course, if you look at his range, he does a million things. Same with David Hennigan. In fact, his sort of bursting onto the West End um, world is with Expresso Bongo, I think it is. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, with Monty Norman. But of course, that's all about the absolutely contemporary scene of the late 50s. You know, that's um, about yes, the coffee yes. shop scene and um, Tommy Steele and, you know, that, those kind of early rockers and you think. Um, and then you've got uh, Half a Sixpence, which is in a way uh, contemporaneous with the Biograph Girl. Yes, that's yeah. um, Edwardian period and this dance yeah. in 1912, 1912 in a different yeah, country, so, of so course. Just after. But, you know, that's all the way back to um, before the First World War. And then um, he does, he, later on, he did Jorrocks, which is uh, a mid 19th century ride, a, a surty story. But it's, yes. a, it's, it's one of those stories about hunting and fishing, and, you know, it's uh, and probably more remembered in the spoofs than in the original. Um, but there's a man who's got this enormous range, and he kept coming back to contemporary music and going back to other eras. And I love the fact that this is outside of his usual. He usually goes for British stuff, and this isn't a British piece. Well, it's a British musical about an American thing, mm. although possibly a universal thing. Silent films, of course, just happens to be made in America yes, at the time. Yes. Um, I love his versatility, and as you say, he's at the top of his game when this is made in 1980. Yes, yes absolutely. Yes, I, do, I, mean, I genuinely don't understand. Exactly as you say, it, it was very well received. It was seen as being you know, a, a great piece. People enjoyed it, it got really good reviews, the audiences loved it. And I don't understand why this is um, 38 years later. This is the first professional production since that, um, since that first premier production. It's been often done by students, it's been done by amateur and community companies. This is the first professional production. I don't understand why, because it is David Henniker at the height of his power. David um, Warner Brown, 22, but writing a wonderful book. They worked so well together. Uh, and exactly, I think I think David Henniker is is far too underrated. He's he's a ripe for a revival in the sense of his yes, yeah, his, his yeah. canon needs to be needs to be looked at again. Really and I think you've touched revived. on that. I think you've, the the question you've asked is the right question. Why did his star fade after his death? Because he is, I th- I think partly because of his versatility. There's nothing dates more than something that's contemporary. But of course, also if then you've also done you know your most famous for an Edwardian piece half sixpence mm. then actually it's going to be very easy for people who don't really know what they're talking about to just label you as old fashioned because everything you touch yes, yeah. once you're gone is old fashioned but of course it's the nature of us all, nature of us all is it not um, and yet every time you look at anything that he's done it's, it's always really rather good uh, and then of course there's the other problem with it it's not a problem but I think I, 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 as you said I hope you won't mind me saying when we were younger certainly in the <laughs> 1980s um, silent films were not you know, they were known to be a historic thing, but they were enough on television. People used to see black and white films on television, whether yes, they were yeah. silent or otherwise. That's all past now, mm. sadly, unless you look into the higher reaches of Freeview or something. But yes. um, 
and people may not know what a biograph girl, you know, what the term means. It, it represents Mary, it's a nickname for Mary Pickford, I think. It was Mary it? Pickford, was the, Florence Lawrence was the yeah. first ever biograph girl. It was the Biograph Studios, yeah. and so she was the face of the Biograph Studios. So Florence Lawrence, fantastic name, um, it is, was the first it? biograph girl. But she was only there for a very short amount of time, and then she left, yeah. and Mary Pickford came. So she was the face of the Biograph Studios, and she was the, uh, yes, yeah, so that's, yeah. that was her term. That's, that's how she was known. It was particularly because uh, one of the things that is touched on a lot in this show is that D.W. Griffiths did not believe in the star system at all and he didn't even credit his actors. Did he not? So, oh, yeah. so people didn't know that she was necessarily called Mary Pickford when she was, while she was with D.W. Griffiths. They knew her as the biograph girl. Yeah, and similarly that with, one up there. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's the biograph girl. Yes, I know her. Uh, but, she, but her name wasn't, wasn't credited at all. Uh, he didn't. He saw it as a mm. ensemble company. He saw it as, well, as his films. Really, yeah, yes. Yeah. And on the one hand, you could say that's a wonderful thing that he saw it as an ensemble yeah. and there shouldn't be stars. But on the other hand, also it was about him being a control freak. I'm not yeah, necessarily yeah. going to say that. That it, they were his pictures. So it was about you know his name was there. Yeah, yeah, yes. And then the <laughs> actors were people who were who were telling his his stories in his films. Uh, and Lillian Gish, of course, the first ever close up because D. W. Griffith yeah. invented the close up. Um, and she, she was the first ever face on the close-up. And there's so much in this show about Mary Pickford leaving to go to Adolf Zucker, not only for more money, but to be America's sweetheart, Mary Pickford, With name, her name yeah. picked out in light, whereas Lillian Gish is still there, believing in D.W. Griffith as a filmmaker and not being credited at all. It's funny, I, once again, we're back to these resonances. Do you know, there's a novelty number from the 1920s, which is still periodically played on the radio, and indeed the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band did a, uh, a copy of it, called um, My Brother Makes the Noises for the Talkies. I don't know that. It's, it's, it's a ridiculous piece, but it's very catchy. But it's, you know, it's a 1920s novelty number when the, the talkies have just come in, and the idea being that actually the person who's singing has a brother who makes all the sound effects, because that was suddenly a new industry. It right. was brand yeah. new. Um, and Lillian Gish is briefly mentioned in it, but um, it's obviously the lyricist has come up, has lost his way in able to find a rhyme. <laughs> but um, I think the line is, he even has a noise for Lillian Gish. And the bonzo is then put a burp in, which is rather ungallant. <laughs> yes. But um, it is there in the original lyric, I think. So, um, but they've, you know, she, to show that she was a name in that period and associated with films and these new fangled talkie films, which are how this sort of transitions at the end. Yes, yes. I, I, I genuinely love all this back and forth. And the other thing you were saying, that idea that you don't credit your actors, but you do credit the director, funnily enough, is the absolute reverse of what happened 30 years on the stage. Um, 30 years earlier on the stage because obviously there's the famous one of the great things that W.S. Gilbert did and we all know him is that he sort of created the modern idea of a director um, I yes. mean he wasn't his he, he developed the ideas of someone who died young somebody called Tom Hood I think from memory but you may know better than I but up to that point it was the actors who um, would direct themselves and the idea that some upstart might come along and tell them how they might do it better uh, was completely in the way. So actually, I, I, once again, I love the parallel, but the reverse parallel yes, with yes. what had happened in theatre literally only 30, 40, 50 yes, years yes. before that again. Yes, yeah. yes, it's certainly something... Perhaps I shouldn't say, but it's, it's certainly something when I was starting out as a director, which was quite a long time ago. I don't believe it for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Free galant. Uh, when I was starting out... Uh, there would be the odd actor who would say, "We well, you know the idea of a director is a, is a very it's a very modern idea." You know, it's like orchestras didn't have conductors and theatres didn't have directors. So, <laughs> so well, it's been around for a while. It has been. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'm not that old. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. I think that's just an argument. In it, back yes. then, it was an argument for actors to take a bit more control. But yes, absolutely. Yeah, that that upsurge of it, I it, I find it. I think it's really strange, and I think audiences will be surprised by the idea when films nowadays are so much on, it's all talked about the name, the star name mm. that's going to carry it, or the two star names, and it's all about their billing arguments and who's getting paid more, etc. Uh, that to think of D.W. Griffith making these incredibly famous films for, for quite a long period without ever crediting any of his actors. Well, we've all been seduced into saying nonsense on the name of a big name. Yes, absolutely, Great. yes. I do just want to then briefly ask about you, if I may, Jenny, because I know that you were nominated for Best Director Award only last year, I think it was. Yes, yes. Uh, that's, for Off that's West right. End, uh, and that's for a piece called Mr Gilly. So, you know, forgive me, you, you, you are a, a woman of great experience and talent. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but, you know, forgive me, how does this show, The Biograph Girl and Mr Gilly just beforehand, sort of fit into your developing career? Oh, that's, very, uh, that's a very interesting question. It's a bit like um, Steve Jobs' quote about you can't join the dots 
going for, going forward in your yes. life. Uh, it's you all really retconning, it, isn't yes, it? Yes, you can yes. really do it looking back. And uh, sometimes I get I get asked uh, people. Some some of the cast here have said, "Oh, so your your company because it's I'm curious is, is is my company. Your company it mainly does musicals." I said, "No, we've never done as a company. We've never done a musical before. I've done musicals yeah. before, obviously, but we haven't." Oh, so is it mainly this? Is it mainly? Ah, <laughs> it's it's mainly things that I find really interesting. So Mr. Gilly could not have been more of a contrast. It was the last mm. thing I did at the Finborough Theatre last year, and it was a play written in 1950 by James Bridey. It was a play about a Scottish schoolmaster in a small mining village in the countryside outside Glasgow and it was a, a play two and three quarter hours long of two or three people on stage talking long conversations about education and the value of art and its place in, in the world and what we want from our education. It was, um, yeah, there was no music in it whatsoever. Uh, Which sounds like a brave choice to be put on today and yet how absolutely resonant. Yes, it you know, was. So discussions on education have never gone away. And why, yes, why would they? I thought it was a it was an amazing piece of theatre. We got great yeah. feedback. We got lovely reviews and great feedback from from audiences. Uh, but it was yeah, it felt like a very important play written in 1950. But it was, was it Alistair Sim associated. Yes, he yes, he yes, was yes. he was first Mr. Gilly when it yes. was first done. It's been and it was made into a, uh, a filmed uh, for the BBC. Uh, and it was it was an amazing piece of a real tub thumping political piece that makes it sound dry and dusty. And it wasn't at no. all, uh, but a, a real political piece about education for the sake of it, for giving people curiosity rather than for exam results yeah. and uh, yeah, ticking boxes. So yeah, no, it was a, it was a very resonant piece, but a completely Worth not different. Value, if you like. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so it's difficult. It's difficult to join the dots, even looking back with my career. I think. I suppose one of the things I'd say is setting up, I set up Mercurius uh, six years ago, and the reason I set it up was because I'd spent a lot of time as a freelance director coming across really interesting pieces that I like of all different styles and, and wanting to do them and trying yeah. to int- interest producers and companies in doing them. And for Sharing your take, passion. Yes, yeah. absolutely, in all different styles. But then you have to try and, you're trying to persuade somebody to take a financial risk on something that you believe in and they might might not necessarily believe in as well so six years ago I set up the company thinking well then I'm going to put yeah. them on myself and in that time we've put on a couple of Ben Johnson comedies we've put on two Thomas Middleton comedies we've put on Mr Gilly we've put on That's sure, a, John Bowen quite play. a range of years if I may say <laughs> It's yes, you we, pluck we from cover everywhere. all sorts. Yes, and yeah, we started great. with some Michael, the Michael Frame oh, yes. uh, translations of uh, Chekhov, yeah. uh, short short plays and short stories. So I suppose, I suppose my career, I've jumped around all over the place. Um, but I suppose my career has been about finding stories that I love and that I feel that I want to tell. Prospecting for gold, if I if I might bring this back a, to a where lovely we link. Yes, well done. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Well, that brings us very nicely back, as you quite rightly pointed out, to the Biograph Girl. Now, I'm definitely going to come and see this because, well, you had me um, when I when I saw it was coming back, even before we'd had this conversation. Wonderful. Um, there's so much about it that has intrigued me, and uh, and I know will delight me. And between you and me, just while whilst we've been recording this interview, I've been hearing the uh, the beautiful strains of harmony coming through various walls because we're in the rehearsal space as we as we record this. That alone has drawn me in. Let alone all the <laughs> other things. But how can people see The Biograph Girl? Well, it's on at the Finborough Theatre, and it's on from the 22nd of May, Tuesday the 22nd of May, to Saturday the 9th of June. It's on from Tuesday to Sunday. We've got some Sunday matinees and some Saturday matinees. So it's a great way of filling up a weekend. Very much so, yes. Yeah, go to the, the Finborough Theatre website, you'll, you'll find it on there. I have to say, it's on for three weeks. The first week, we have ten tickets left for the whole of the first so week. Selling. We sold out the first four performances. It's selling very well. So, um, But there's still tickets yeah. available if people want to, want to come along. So, yes, the Finborough Theatre website, and you can see all the details on it there. And it gives you all, all lots of details. And also about the cast. We have an astonishing cast. Cast of nine. Lots of uh, West End musical theatre credits. Where Mary Pickford has been... In Glinda and Wicked in the West End, and our uh, that's Sophie Lindley, and our Lillian Gish, Emily Langham, has uh, was playing young Carlotta in a Follies at the National Theatre. You've also got one of the alumni of the improvised musical, I think. Yes, we have Matthew Cavendish, who plays Max Sennett, amazing physical comedy, physical theatre actor, beautiful singer as well, and a great actor who's been in a the play that goes wrong, Indeed. and and also uh, the, the Christmas Carol that goes wrong on television. So yeah, he's done a lot of things with them. Yes. So people can uh, go to the website, um, the dates are all online. More about you, Jenny. How can people co- um, contact you or find out more about your career or what's going on? Uh, well, we have a website for Mercurius Theatre. It's www.mercuriustheatre. That's 
I'm going to spell it out. Yes, please it's do. An unusual spelling. Yes. It's M E R C U R I U S www.mercuriustheatre.co.uk and there's all the details there about, about productions coming up we've got a wonderful production, one of the cast here uh, for the Biograph Girl, Charlie Rudd has written a really interesting play about Charlotte Chark, who was Colly yeah. Kibber's daughter and was one of the first actresses of the Regency uh, period, who uh, early, slightly earlier than the Regency period uh, who played the breeches roles who started playing the male roles in theatre uh, we've got that coming up in, in the autumn at the Old Red Lion, so there's details of productions to come up as well as details about the Biograph Girl and our past productions. If people want a, a lovely varied diet of good theatre it seems to me that your website is a very good place to start. I think that's well said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny it's been lovely talking to you I look forward to seeing the show I hope that you and I will also have a chance to talk again about any other uh, endeavours that you have which will be of interest to musical talk and absolutely to me because I could talk to you for hours I think. Oh, that's wonderful I would, I would love that this has been really interesting thank you. Musical Talk And there we are, the wonderful Jenny Eastop there. She's an amazing director and such good fun to talk to. I could really have spoken to her for a very much longer time. So, how can you see The Biograph Girl? Well, as you can hear, tickets are starting to disappear quite quickly. So, you better get going. It opened today, the 22nd of May, and it's on until the 9th of June. And as Jenny said, there are performances on both Saturdays and Sundays. You need to go online to find out the details. And to do that, go to the website www.finborough.theatre.co.uk or you can phone the box office on 01223 357 851. And of course you can also go to the Mercurius Theatre website, which Jenny was telling you about, to find out more about the show from that and also what the production company is doing next. Remember, when it opened in 1980, the reviews were astoundingly good. It was hailed as a great British musical, and it's going to be a real privilege to have a chance to see it. And, fact fans, here's a little historical nugget. Did you know that Lillian Gish was in the original audience when it opened at the Phoenix Theatre in 1980? Fancy seeing your own life portrayed on stage, when you yourself have been an actor. Quite an amazing parallel again. Well, that's not it for today's episode. Let's leave the Biograph Girl aside for the moment and catch up with our old friend David Herzog, who's going to tell us more about the show that he's helping to develop for the Edinburgh Festival Fringe this summer, Chweddle. Here's David Herzog. Musical Talk Hello again, musical talkers. It's Dave here. So I'm here today with all the latest gossip from Hweddle, the show we're taking up to the Edinburgh Festival Fringe in August. As I mentioned previously on the program, we are taking up a devised piece all based on Welsh folklore mythology and the Welsh culture and language as well. The full title of our piece has now become Hweddle, Fairy Tales from Wales, starring myself, also Daniela May, April Herzog, my lovely wife, and Edwina Lee and Bloss Berrigan Jr., the five of us have been taking care of the nitty-gritty stuff, booking accommodation, signing contracts, getting ourselves added to the French brochure, all that lovely stuff. Now that that's all done, the five of us are now doing the fun stuff, putting together our favorite Welsh fairy tales and folklore stories for a 45-minute fringe-friendly show. We've started the writing process by sitting across the coffee table and throwing as many ideas into the pot as possible. It's been very exciting, and we're about to start getting the show on its feet in the next couple of days. The writing process so far has been darn good fun. To show you what I mean, here are some exclusive behind-the-scenes, surreptitiously recorded conversations of myself and my fellow castmates during the writing process. Enjoy! Hey, this is exciting, and Daniela and I have both had a sort of ethereal kind of image in our head, and then David's brought up this idea of putting like interjecting funny little Welsh bits in and we say, Oh we hadn't thought of that. Well yes it could be funny. Why couldn't it be funny? It's just not what we what what mm. either Daniela or I, or I happen to have originally imagined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Daniela basically had pictured a sort of a fairly dark version of it, which when I when we first started toying with this idea, that was the first idea I had in my head as well, mm -hmm. like a sort of very Midsummer Night's Dreamy type vibe That's the kind of thing in the woods, tales, in the forest, so very yeah. lots of green, lots of, yeah. you know, yeah. ethereal Celtic. is a good word, Celtic. Kind of. 
Now to, now, to know this next door, you have to know how to pronounce this letter. This letter is the letter ech, which is the C-H. And it's like, now you Scotsmen and Scots, you know, you Scottish folk will have no problem with this. feel of that, because then mm. when, when we saw one in Edinburgh, it was you went into a bar and it was just, they were just, you didn't know who was in the cast. Oh, I see, yeah. Like, mm. We could be sitting around and joining them in the audience. Oh, yeah, I'd love something a bit unusual like that. and Because like, yeah. we've got that like, in the round space and it looks like we, I don't know how flexible it's going to be, what we can do with it, but we, it's not us and them, it's not end on. Yeah. See, we could be dotted almost in the audience. People start, and then like we could be coming, and then we get up and do stuff. Do I saw a show in Edinburgh that was like that. Do you know what'd be really nice. Although I'm throwing this into a story that we don't have at the moment, is to like make Welsh cakes. I thought the Welsh cakes just a second and... ago. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about that. Yeah, have like a baking okay. element to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe they have to write things on slate. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> because we have a lot of slate in North Wales. Feed them. People love free food. Feed mm-hmm. them some Welsh. Cake. Feed them some some Welsh whiskey. Don't do that. That's expensive. I always thought about making it a bit like a children's show because. I adore yeah. Ultimately, it food. might be like yeah. it'll be very yeah. family friendly because yeah, of it's because time. it's PQA. Yeah. And we've yeah. got what a three o'clock so, slot or a four o'clock. It's it's yeah it's yeah. it's afternoon. Yeah. We've got puppets in it as well. Yeah, I've, I've done like shows that adults have loved, but they're for kids. Oh sure, yeah. 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 you make it good enough. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it sounds like we definitely want that sort of interactive. Relax. Element or, or relaxed, yeah. I kind of lo- I love that kind of element, like when performing and you talk to the audience, like kind yeah, of yeah. Them, yeah. Welsh language in particular, and like a lot of the names of places, just even the names of places are like are so. Uh, I don't know, like no one outside of Wales has any who had to say it. Yeah. Which and fascinates me. And I've always said that to April as well, haven't we? We could I? do like a Welsh rap. Like if you go on YouTube, <laughs> there's this there's this video. And, and it's writing just the rap. The, the, the yeah, rap is in English, you. but he goes, oh, do you know what they call a microwave in Welsh? It's a popsy pin, which, by the, which by the way it isn't, but um, that's near the table there. Probably purposes. Make the dot, it's fine. Um, or something like that. Um, anyway, they, they end up going into this song, you should look it up, and it goes something like, Put it in the popty ping. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> That's amazing. It's funny. I could watch it for ages. See, I we was could saying, do, we, could, we could wrap the house down. How white <laughs> and kind of middle class I am. It's amazing how many shows I've actually wrapped in. <laughs> so, <laughs> <something> <laughs> like, another instance. None that I've seen. <laughs> Chwedl, Fairy Tales from Wales will be at PQA venues in Edinburgh from August 23rd to the 27th. Tickets will be available on the Fringe Festival website. Thanks, as always, for having me on the program, friends. And thank you, Mr. Ribbits, for being so gracious. He is as kind as he is handsome. We will catch up again soon once the show is more on its feet and as we get more into the rehearsal process. At that time, I will have some exclusive interviews with the cast and writers of Chwedl, Fairy Tales from Wales. In the meantime, if you'd like to stay in touch, and let's face it, why wouldn't you? You can always find me on Twitter at DavidHerzog06, and you can follow our show on Facebook at Hweddle Fairy Tales from Wales. Thanks again, friends. We'll talk to you again soon. Back over to you, Thus. Musical Talk Well, there we are, David Herzog, just updating us again about Hweddle and enjoying himself in the process by the sound of it. Stay tuned to Musical Talk's future episodes and you'll be able to hear more about how that show is developing. Well, that probably brings this episode to an end. Remember, if you do want to go and see The Biograph Girl, and I hope you will, go along to the Finsborough Theatre website and perhaps I'll see you there. But for the time being, I'm going to bring this episode to a close. And you know how I like to do it. I use that very simple word because I'm a very simple person. Indeed, everyone thinks I'm simple. It's goodbye. And here I am saying it now. Goodbye. This episode of Musical Talk presented by Thos Ribbits and David Herzog and edited by Thos Ribbits. Copyright Musical Talk 2018. To find out more about the world of musical talk and listen to past episodes, go along to our website www.musicaltalk.co.uk 
or subscribe to us on iTunes and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can at Musical Talk Thos. Happy with that? Yeah, very We're still happy, recording yeah. at the moment. Obviously, anything in or out? On the whole, it seemed very good to me. I don't me. think so, apart from my inability to string sentences together at oh, certain points, but yeah. Other we than all, we all have that. No, I, 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 everyone sounds like a genius when they're finished. I, I do cut out most of the ears and bits and pieces. There's some magic to work there. <laughs> but yeah. um, lovely. That was genuinely gorgeous. Thank you very much indeed. Fantastic. So that's that's really Tuesday. interesting. Yes, I hope it wasn't too hard the conversation. From no, no, I, you know, was, I hope I wasn't was giving you anything too dark. No, no, no. That was You're so giving me nothing but gold. Oh, well, gold digging. Once again, it's, it's thematic, isn't it? <laughs>